Hello, and welcome to Contagious Conversations. I'm your host, Claire Stinson. Every episode, we'll hear from inspiring leaders and innovators who make the world healthier and safer for us all. Contagious Conversations is brought to you by the CDC Foundation, an independent nonprofit that builds partnerships to help the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention save and improve more lives. Joining me on the phone today is Dr. Lex Frieden, a professor of biomedical informatics and rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Lex also directs the Independent Living Research Utilization Program at TIRR Memorial Hermann in Houston. Lex is known as an architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and a catalyst in the worldwide disabilities rights and independent living movements. In this episode, Lex shares his personal story, his passion for independent living by people with disabilities, and his memories about working closely with former President George H.W. Bush. Lex is also the recipient of the 2017 Freeze Prize for Improving Health. Welcome, Lex. Claire, thank you for having me today. I'm glad to be here. We're excited to talk to you today. So for starters, Lex, tell us about your life story. How did you become a champion for people living with disabilities? Well, you use the word champion, and it's hard for me to think of myself in those terms. I mean, I was uh, a regular kid, grew up in northwestern Oklahoma, and decided to go on to college, as most of my classmates did. I was interested in studying electrical engineering, as um, my uncle had been an engineer at a television station, and I thought that technology was really cool. But uh, a few weeks after... I started school, I was in a car accident with a number of other students. We had a head-on collision, two carloads of students. Everyone in the cars had been drinking, including the driver, and uh, my neck was broken. I was not aware of the implications of that at the time, but I did have the good fortune to, to be treated quickly in Oklahoma City and then transferred to Tier Hospital in Houston, where I received medical rehabilitation. That was a a good experience for me because when I left there uh, a few months later, the doctor said to me, Lex, uh, you're probably not going to walk again. You'll use a wheelchair, but uh, you can do anything that you might have done before the accident if you can figure out how to do it on four wheels. And at the time, that didn't seem intimidating to me because in 1968, we had astronauts circling the moon ready for a landing. And I thought, if that's our future, then wheelchairs shouldn't be providing many barriers for me. And I was eager to go back to college. Then then the surprises began to hit because when I applied for college, my admission was turned down by the university because I used a wheelchair. And... uh, that kind of threw me for a loop, Claire. It probably would anybody. Yes, absolutely. Would you say that was a defining moment in your your pathway? I'm sure it it was because after that, I I had a hard time regrouping. And uh, fortunately, there was another university in the city, Tulsa University, and I applied to go there, and they welcomed me. I was concerned because there weren't any wheelchair accessible buildings on that campus as there had been on the campus of Royal Roberts University but the dean there whom I met with said there's a new building coming this fall and if you'll tell us what courses you want to take we'll put them in that building which made a lot of sense for me they didn't have to build ramps to every building for me they just had to put me and and the courses in the same building where we fit together. That, again, was kind of a life lesson that I have retained about how one can solve problems sometimes more simply than they might seem at first. I really took it upon myself, given those experiences, to find out whether people around the world, around my state, around my community were affected by disability the same way that I was. And uh, that has given me the opportunity to to learn a lot, to contribute, I think, to the body of law that we have regarding the rights of people with disabilities and to continue to look for new pathways to problem solving in America. 
That's a really powerful story. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. We understand you had a special relationship with George H.W. Bush, especially related to your work as an architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, just briefly, I I spent a lot of time after I graduated from college uh, working with groups trying to organize disability advocacy groups, uh, speaking before public assemblies, including uh, congressional hearings. And at one point in the early 80s, uh, President Reagan invited me to to be the executive director of the National Council on the Handicap, now called the National Council on Disability. And, and it gave me the opportunity to work with a group of presidentially appointed people who understood disability because they had family members with disabilities or they worked in the disability field or they themselves had disabilities. And, and together with that group and the staff that we had, a remarkable uh, staff of young people, we made a, a report for the president about the needs of people with disabilities in the United States. And the first recommendation in that report was that there should be a law protecting uh, people with disabilities from discrimination. In 1986, the report was completed in January, and we had scheduled a meeting with the president to present this report, believing that he would welcome the report and want to have immediately a press conference on the White House lawn to to discuss the goals of America to have a a law preventing uh, discrimination on the basis of disability. That didn't happen because on the morning the, the appointment was scheduled, the spaceship Challenger blew up on takeoff, and it was a, a sad day for all of us as Americans. And our meeting was rescheduled, only this time with the vice president, and Vice President Bush welcomed us. This was a few days after the disaster to his office in the White House, and we discussed this report. Interestingly enough, the vice president had told us that he had read the report the night before with Barbara and that they identified with our first recommendation because they had a child with a disability who had died early on, And they had another child, one of their boys, who had learning disability or difficulty reading. And they understood how the system sometimes did not accommodate people with different characteristics, including disabilities. So the vice president said before we left that meeting that he would report to the president and that he was himself very interested in our our proposal, not only that one, but the other ones in our report, he said that he would do what he could do as vice president, and if he had more opportunity in the future to help us, he would. Two years later, he was elected president, and two years after that, he signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, That first meeting with him was a, a, a real seminal moment because it was clear from the beginning that he had a heartfelt interest in our interest and that he understood clearly from his own personal experience and and that of his family he told us about an uncle whom he had that had a disability and so he understood disability in a way that some people don't and that was important because throughout the ADA battle he was a champion and every turn when there was a choice to be made about whether to be more or less aggressive in terms of establishing these rights. He was right there with us. So I do consider him to be a a dear friend, and I'm sorry we lost him. And uh, he'll forever be remembered by people with disabilities as the Abraham Lincoln of the disability movement. What an incredible friend and ally to have. Did you maintain a relationship with him through the years? Yes, of course. Um, He invited my family and and I to uh, to go to the movies. <laughs> Just a, a few years ago, we went to the the local theater in Houston with he and his family and some other close friends, and we would have a kind of an annual celebration around the time of the uh, anniversary of the ADA. And 
he even created a uh, an award called the Bush Medal for Disability Rights that he gave to a number of people in the course of his life. And uh, we we had some some intriguing uh, moments and some nice times. That the first time he ever invited us to uh, Kenny Bunkport to visit their home there, he realized I think the day before that he didn't have a ramp to the house for those of us in wheelchairs to to come in and uh, so he built a ramp the morning that we we visited the uh, the home there in Kenny Bunkport he really did that's awesome and what that, i'm sure you'll never forget that no no none of those memories will ever go away um it, that whole episode uh, beginning with the the proposal to have an Americans with Disabilities Act through the work that we did to get the bill passed and and the signing, the passage by the Congress, the signing ceremony in July 26, 1990. Anyone who was involved in that will remember it always. The, The signing ceremony on the lawn of the White House was the largest signing ceremony ever up until that date. And uh, there were 3,000-some-odd people on the White House lawn uh, when the president said the walls of exclusion should come tumbling down. It was uh, brilliant. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that with us and sharing your memories of the president. So, Lex, a number of our listeners may not remember life before the ADA. Can you share some of the challenges that existed for people living with disabilities before the act was passed? Well, I mean, remember that was... 35, 40 years or more ago, it's almost like the Stone Age. I I have thought about that question before and, and casually answered it and then thought, you know, young people, when they think about what happened in the 1970s, are equivalent to me thinking about what happened in the 1930s. I mean, it is a, a long, long time ago. And many things have changed, thank goodness, some of them as a result of the law and some of them just as a result of progress. But about the time that we started working on the ADA, we had no idea there would be uh, Internet, for example. We did have computers that began to replace typewriters, but nobody ever thought about a worldwide network for communications at that time. And the things that we dealt with were businesses that could discriminate freely uh, people would go to apply for jobs, and the employer would say, no, you're not eligible, you are disabled. And they'd just have an outright prohibition against hiring people who were obese or people who had any kind of health condition. It doesn't make sense now. It's hard to believe, but that's the way life was. Restaurants weren't required to have uh, ramps. Neither were motels or hotels. Movie theaters didn't have any accommodations whatsoever. If you wanted to watch television and you were deaf, there were no captions. Life was a lot different. When we went down the street, many streets didn't have ramps on them as they do now. And you'd you'd roll in the street, not on the sidewalk, and you would uh, try to find a driveway to get up. And if you tried to get into a building, the most likely route would be through the the loading dock because there was typically a ramp there for the carts and you'd roll up the ramp and use the freight elevator to get to the floor you were going to. And this is not only visitors, these are people who sometimes worked in those buildings. So it was, life was much, much different before July 26, 1990. After that, almost immediately, every transit system in the country put lifts on their buses. The law required that and they did it. You know, some of the changes occurred quite rapidly. But the thing about that question, Claire, that frustrates me a little bit is the things that have not changed since the ADA, the backward steps that we have taken since that time and some of the progress that should have been made that hasn't. There are still millions of people with health conditions and disabilities who want to get jobs and they can't get them because employers not now overtly discriminating, but I think perhaps their attitudes affect the way they make hiring decisions, and they just make these assumptions that somebody, because they have a certain health condition or characteristic, cannot do a job. And yet people are very qualified or they wouldn't be applying for these jobs, and we need them in the workforce. So as things have improved dramatically, we still have a ways to go. 
I'm glad that it's hard to imagine life before the ADA, though, and we have you to thank for that. So thank you for everything that you've done. No, I appreciate that. And I, I again, I can't take singular credit for that. I mean, the, the disability movement, 36 million people with disabilities at the time, each one of those people presumably had two parents, um, so you know, or at least two close friends who understood and supported them. You've got a hundred million people in the United States in 1990 who probably would have uh, stood up to say pass this bill. So Congress had to pay attention to it, and then you know there were many organizers besides myself, and some of them still living, who worked very very hard to see the passage of that bill, and that's not to mention the members of Congress who changed their agendas in order to support the uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it was it was not a singular act. It, there were many people involved. And I have to pay tribute to my my colleague Bob Bergdorf who was an, an attorney that was in the council with me working and who literally uh, helped to draft the first uh, draft of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Without all these people, there would be no ADA. Absolutely. We'll be right back with Dr. Lex Frieden. Since this is a show about contagious conversations, we want to hear from you. Each episode, we'll ask you a question. And this episode's question is, do you have a story to share about how the ADA has benefited you or someone you know? Just go to cdcfoundation.org slash conversations and click on the email icon to answer. That's cdcfoundation.org slash conversations. And if you share your thoughts with us, you'll be eligible to win Contagious Conversations merchandise. And now, back to our conversation with Lex. Can I ask you, what is the one thing from the ADA that you consider the most important component? Well, I think the principle of the ADA is the most important component. The the ADA changed the paradigm from thinking about people with disabilities as those who have diagnoses. We got away from the medical model, and I think this is the profound lesson that we have to teach and that we learned from the ADA. People, People may have functional impairments. It may be difficult for me to climb steps because I use a wheelchair, but it doesn't mean that I can't get to the top of the steps if I use a ramp, an alternative. So therefore, it's not my disability, it's not my spinal cord injury that prevents me from getting to the top of those steps. It is the environment. And if the environment were built properly, if the environment, and furthermore, it's the social environment if if people would accept the fact that mental illness is a part of our society that there are a number of people in the population who as a result of genetic background or other disease may have mental abnormalities we have to accept that's part of life it's part of our society and we need to accommodate people with every type of physical or mental uh, condition uh, anybody with a sensory impairment. I mentioned the captioning on the television. Deaf people were asking for captioning well before the ADA was passed. And now that we have captioning on the television, it's hard to walk into a restaurant with a television that you don't see captioning. And when you don't, you wonder where it is. Everybody uses that. Everybody uses the ramps on the curb. And everybody will benefit from engaging all people, regardless of their characteristic. And this is how the disability movement sort of merges with the, with the uh, movement for racial equality, equality and, and gender equality. Discrimination is based on misunderstanding. It's based on lack of knowledge. And it also uh, is based on, on hatred. And I think that we can alter that. And I think the ADA was a part of that. Uh, thinking of people with different characteristics is healthy for us. And, and without people of different characteristics, we wouldn't have a beautiful world that we do, and we wouldn't have nearly as much progress as we've made. We have to do everything we can to be inclusive 
in our planning for the workplace, in our planning for the community, in our planning for the world. We, it needs to be an inclusive world, and then people don't feel left out, and they don't uh, feel resentful, and, and they're likely to be contributors. Thank you for so eloquently answering that question. To follow up on our discussion of how the ADA has transformed life for Americans with disabilities, do you think there is a role for public-private partnerships to improve the lives of people living with disabilities? Well, it's the only way we're going to get anything done. I, the private sector can can move quickly when they need to get things done or when they have a desire to do that, provided that they have an economic basis. So in order to have an economic basis, you got to have a fair uh, a playing field that's that's workable, and that's partly the government's responsibility. Uh, the public-private partnerships get a lot done, and they get them done quickly in terms of changing our communities, in terms of improving the quality of our lives. We can't depend on one sector or another. That's the beauty of America. Uh, we have a society where we are not expecting the government to do everything. And by the same token, we don't depend on the private sector to manage and maintain all the infrastructure. So together we can achieve a lot. And people who are are working on plans to improve their communities need to engage all sectors, including uh, the public sector, in solving these problems. And, and I think empowerment really the empowerment of individuals to be engaged in these uh, projects and to work uh, jointly with uh, public and and private uh, sector is very important. And I think that that's why we need to uh, encourage communities to reach out more and partner with the citizens and why the private sector shouldn't just go off and do something independently of the views of the community. Any kind of forward planning or or progress that we make will be dependent, in this country at least, on uh, collaboration. And that certainly relates to solving problems that people with disabilities face every day. We're a big fan of public-private partnerships here at the CDC Foundation, so we're really happy to hear that. So, Lex, looking ahead, especially in light of so many baby boomers aging currently, What are some of the challenges you see for Americans living with disabilities or the growing number of people who will be living with disabilities? Well, that's a thoughtful question, Claire. Um, You you hit the, the nail, the proverbial nail on the head when you said baby boomers. That's a key word here. So between 1946 and 1964, 76 million people were born in the United States. All of those people, like me, are becoming older and retirement age, and uh, and people who are aging will naturally acquire disabilities. Not everybody will acquire the same disability, and not everybody's disability will be as profound or severe as the next person's. But people with age lose hearing acuity. They lose visual acuity. They lose memory acuity. People simply age, and they age at different rates. And um, by the year 2021, uh, half of those 76 million people will have some kind of impairment, some kind of disability. That will have a profound effect on our infrastructure, particularly our health care infrastructure. We do not now have the means to accommodate all the people who will become physically disabled or who will need assistance because of memory loss or intellectual disability, we don't have the means to accommodate them in their homes and the community. We don't have an infrastructure of community-based support that is that is resilient enough, that is uh, strong enough to support uh, all these people in the community. We hardly have the infrastructure now, and and that is a challenge that all of us face. We face it for ourselves. We face it for our our children face it for us, and, and our grandchildren will face it in the future. Uh, we've got to build a, uh, a stronger community-based culture of social service and health service programs, and that that, that is the biggest challenge I think we face in America right now. Well said, and an important point. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story with us in general. You've had a profound influence on society and led an incredible life. What advice do you give to others living with disabilities and to their families, friends, and colleagues as well? I think people are motivated by life experiences, and I think sometimes people tend to moderate their enthusiasm over their life experiences. I think we should, anybody, people with and without disabilities, uh, will enjoy life more if you realize these experiences can motivate one to make positive change for themselves, their own families, and for others. And I think people need to be engaged in the, in the social discourse. I think people need not to be frustrated by their disagreement with others, but to be engaged in, in conversation and, and in, in social action that is intended to improve uh, the society for everyone else. Uh, and I think every time we hit a frustrating barrier, every time we hit a bump in the road, uh, we shouldn't be stopped by that, but we should be motivated to figure out what happened, why it happened, and how we can fix it, how we can make it better for ourselves and for others. That certainly motivated me when when they said I couldn't go to college because I had a disability. And it motivated everyone else who worked in the disability movement because we could see we weren't the only ones affected by that problem. And I think that's generally true with issues that people face in their daily lives. It's, we don't need to personalize these things. They're not just us effect. We're not the only ones frustrated by some of these issues. And if we work together, we can resolve them and we can make uh, our lives better and we can be happier uh, and our families can be uh, better off as a result of that. So I, I, I think appreciate life and understand that our personal experiences can be very motivating and we need to motivate ourselves to find ways that we can contribute and be rewarded by that, just the notion that we are contributing to improving the, the life and the world for everybody else as well as ourselves. I think the ADA affected not only the lives of people with disabilities, but everybody's life. And I think that legislation changed our infrastructure, but it also changed the way we look at disability and health issues. I think, again, before the ADA, people with disabilities were seen as different. They're not a part of society, and we were segregated. Sometimes because we were simply not able to negotiate the environment. But today, people should be able to negotiate the environment, and if they're not, they should file a complaint under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We will continue to make progress particularly in the area of employment. And I think more people need to understand that regardless of what you're uh, able to contribute, you can be able in the workplace and that employers should understand people with disabilities can achieve anything anyone else can achieve, particularly if they're appropriately accommodated. Really important words of advice. Lex, I have so enjoyed talking to you today. You are such an inspiration, and I know you will inspire our listeners. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. To explore bonus content from today's episode, including a photo of Lex with the Bush family at their home in Kennebunkport, Maine, and video of Lex receiving the Freeze Prize for Improving Health, go to cdcfoundation.org slash conversations. Thanks for listening to Contagious Conversations, produced by the CDC Foundation and available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to visit cdcfoundation.org slash conversations for show notes and bonus content. And if you like what you just heard, please pass it along to your colleagues and friends, rate the show, leave a review, and tell others. It helps us get the word out. Thanks again for tuning in and join us next time for another episode of Contagious Conversations. Contagious Conversations.